Welcome to the Ashby Village Science and Ideas Group. My name is Joe Evinger. Uh, our guest this afternoon is Marco Zangrando. Marco is an Italian physicist who works at the Elettra Synchrone Trieste, the Synchrotron Free Electron Laser Facilities located in and around Trieste, Italy. He's speaking to us right now from Italy, where it is just past midnight. So extra gold stars, uh, Marco, for staying up so late. Uh, Sarah and I uh, are very uh, proud to be friends with Marco and his spouse, who is also a physicist, Barbara. And we've met their two daughters, uh, Guy and Chiara, and we have visited them several times in Italy. And Marco and Barbara visited us, and Marco has visited us when presenting papers here at uh, Cal Berkeley. Marco obtained his MS in physics from the University of Trieste and, and a PhD in physical engineering from the Czech Technical University in Prague in Czech Republic. Can you imagine you know, learning, getting your PhD in a foreign country and learning that in a foreign language? Well, Marco has done that. Uh, he, uh, he's been working at the Electra designing uh, installing, commissioning, and opening uh, optical systems dedicated to the transport and diagnostics of X-ray photon beams, I'm lost already, that are used to carry on cutting edge experience. Uh, uh, Marco Zangrando will guide us today on a journey spanning through radio and microwaves, rainbows, mirrors, interstellar vacuum, light speed, X-rays, perhaps mad scientists, later, lasers, Right, shifts. I could go on and on. You'll see soon that Marco has a gift, though, for explaining some very complicated things in relatively plain layperson's terms. Marco has also promised to explain to us what the equation on his T-shirt means, which I will now show you. So there you have it. Take a minute to look at that equation. And perhaps we can get Marco in a little bit to explain just what the heck is going on in that t-shirt. Okay, I encourage you at uh, certain pause times as Marco identifies them to ask any questions you might have. And uh, now is my pleasure to introduce Marco Zangranda. Ciao Marco and benvenuto. Ciao Joe, grazie. Thank you everybody for being here and for giving me this, for giving me this opportunity to, to speak to you and talking about synchrotron light sources, which are all around the world. And you actually have one of them just on top of the Berkeley Hill in the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So uh, before starting, I mean, uh, regarding the t-shirt, uh, I must confess that that t-shirt is about a, a, a type of physics, which is not, my type of physics that is uh, particle physics i am a, a material science physicist but uh, nonetheless what is written on that uh, t-shirt is basically kind of uh, um, a recap of what we know so far about uh, the unification of the forces that uh, rule uh, the the universe in the universe we have the gravity we have the electromagnetism and we have the so-called weak and strong nuclear forces. Uh, these four forces keep everything together. And the, the challenge of a physicist, of a theoretical physicist, has always been, I mean, since uh, 100 years ago, to unify as much as possible all these um, forces. So at the, at the beginning, for instance, electricity was a different story with respect to magnetism now they put them together and you have electromagnetism and this is happening the same also between gravity and electromagnetism or the weak nuclear force with other forces and the, the work is not done yet they are still working on that so that's why our universe so far because so far they managed to unify part of the whole story but there is still much more work uh, to do. So yeah, that's more or less what that t-shirt is all about. So if you want, I can start sharing my presentation if it's okay. Yes, please do. Okay. 
please let me know if you then see it correctly. Yes, I can, you can see it. OK, thanks. So as I said, I would like to thank again everybody, Sarah, Joe, and the organizer, and all of you for being there. Uh, before starting a forward, uh, have a look at this map. You probably know this map. This is the Berkeley, Oakland uh, area. And if you zoom to this crossroad here, this is the crossroad between Ashby and Shattuck Avenue. Why am I showing that? Because uh, if you go to the satellite uh, view of that, you will see this uh, house that is uh, in the red circle. And that is the house that where actually I used to live for a couple of months back in 2003, when I was there to work at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is the laboratory on top of the hill above the University of California. So that is the house where I used to live. And it was much better when I was there because it was painted in pinkish and, and, and bluish colors. But OK, so I would say that for this reason, I am kind of entitled to be here in the Ashby Village and, and, and talk to you. What am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about synchrotrons. What are synchrotrons? Why, why do we need synchrotrons? What we can do with synchrotrons? To start this uh, journey, I decided to uh, uh, talk about probably the biggest question in science that uh, was ever raised, and which was, what is the universe made of? Uh, what is everything we have around made of? This question, I would say that nowadays is, uh, I mean, at least there are other questions that are as important and as this one, which are uh, being, uh, let's say, discussed and, and, and tackled by physicists and, and scientists, I would say that so far we kind of know what the matter around us is made of, but still there is uh, room to improve, room to learn, and one of the way to do that is to use synchrotrons. But Let's go to, uh, to the question, what everything is made of? Well, every solid, liquid, or gas is made of atoms. Atoms comes from the Greek atomos, which means uncuttable. And think about that. To build the whole universe is just enough to have less than 10 different, 100 different kind of atoms, which are basically uh, shown in the periodic table of, of, uh, of the elements. So these are the... the the bricks with which you can build the whole universe. And uh, regarding the atom, probably you, I don't know, someone saw this, uh, uh, an image like this, which is uh, depicting an atom. An atom typically is imagined as a nucleus where you have protons and neutrons and a cloud of electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus. So this is let's say the initial classical idea of an atom. This is not anymore strictly correct from the physical point of view, but still gives the, a good idea about uh, atoms. So atoms, we cannot see them in real life. Are we sure they exist? Yes, we do. It is really possible to see them. In this picture, the, the small spheres that you see are individual atoms on a surface on a gold surface and it is so possible to see the atom exist well actually we know that ex they exist we were also able to break them and see how they are made inside so let's suppose that i want to see them how can i how can i do that i need a probe i need something to use to study atoms to be able to see how they are made how they look like and so on and so forth. So since I want to see something, light is a natural candidate. But what kind of light? I mean, many different kinds of light uh, exist. We have the sun, we have candles, we have light bulbs, neon tubes, laser, and so on and so forth. So, but before uh, answering this question, what is light? I mean, we give light for, for granted, but from the physical point of view, light is an electromagnetic wave. 
which also have behaviors that are typical to particles. And for maybe some, someone of you heard the, the, the famous uh, uh, term, the wave particle duality. Let's put it in, in, in a corner for the moment. For what uh, we are interested in, light is a wave. We know what waves are. We have waves in water, we have waves in the crowd at stadiums. During an earthquake, the, the earth, the soil is uh, experienced uh, wave movement. And how can we imagine the wave concept, uh, let's say, related to, to light? Well, have a look at, at this uh, picture. It, I think it's familiar. I mean, when the light coming from the sun goes through a prism, you will see the rainbow. You will see the rainbow also in particular uh, atmospheric condition. But uh, if you <clears throat> don't know it, I will tell you, but probably you know it, I, I will tell you that the different colors within a rainbow, where do they come from? Well, actually, they are simply different component of the white light that was coming from the sun, each of them having a different color, which means that they have a different quantity, which is called the wavelength. And the wavelength is, of course, the distance between two peaks, two subsequent peaks along a wave. So in light, we have different colors that are characterized by different wavelengths. OK, this is for the visible light. Uh, oh, just a, a brief mention. The particle nature of light is related to the concept of photons. And the concept of photons was, let's say, introduced by this guy here, Mr. Einstein, which we'll, we will find uh, who we will find later on in, in the presentation. The light, the visible light, so light, uh, what we typically uh, refer to when we mention the term light is the visible light. And the visible light is just a small part of a bigger family, which includes also not so similar siblings. I mean, other components that you, you cannot, maybe it's difficult to imagine that they are brothers to visible light. And they all, uh, make up the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is a family of electromagnetic radiations that are going from the radio waves. So the, the thing that is used to transmit uh, radio broadcasts around the, uh, the globe, then you have microwaves. Oh, let me see. Uh, let me use the, the pointer if you see it. Do you see the pointer? Yes. Hopefully, yes. Well, OK. Uh, so we have radio waves. We have microwaves, those that are used to warm uh, foods in, in, in the kitchen. We have the infrared uh, light. Then we have the visible light, which is this small portion of the spectrum. Then the ultraviolet uh, radiation, which is the one uh, that uh, make us uh, get in tanned when we, when we are at the beach and we are sunbathing uh, at the beach. Then we have the X-rays. And the X-rays, you probably know uh, about them. Their X-rays are used to, uh, to create radiographies, so images of our bones through uh, through the skin and through the muscle and, and different tissues. So saying again, the wavelength for visible light is, uh, uh, let's say, dividing it into the different colors. But if you keep on changing the wavelengths, you will exit from the visible light and you will enter into the ultraviolets, the soft X-rays, the hard X-rays. And if you go in the other direction, you will go to the infrared, microwaves, radio waves, and so on. OK, so we have many expressions of the same family. Which one of which part of this spectrum is the right one to use if we want to see better atoms? OK, let's make an analogy. Let's suppose that you enter a dark room 
with things on the floor. Soccer balls, I, of course, since I am an Italian, for me, it, they are footballs, but okay, never mind. Then you have tennis balls and glass marbles on the floor. Let's suppose that I ask you to enter the room the first time and I just put some soccer balls on the floor and the, the room is pitch black. You enter there and how do you realize that uh, you have soccer balls on your floor? Well, you will feel something with your feet and then at a certain point with one foot, you will probably put it on top of the soccer ball and you will immediately learn and understand that on the floor we have soccer balls. Let's do the same experiment, but now we have tennis balls. So you will enter, you will see, you will feel something with your feet on the floor, but the, in order to be sure, you will grab one of these balls with your hand. And once you have the ball in your hand, you will immediately understand that they are tennis balls. Last part of the experiment, glass marbles. You will enter the room, hopefully not sleeping onto the marbles. You will feel something with your feet. You will put your hand on the floor, but still you, you will not be sure. You have to take one of the glass marbles with your fingers, and then in that moment, you will know that those are glass marbles. What is all about? The point is that the probe should be, should match. The probe size should match the sample size. If you think about it, soccer balls, foot, tennis balls, hand, glass marbles, fingers. So the general idea is that if you want to probe something, the probe should be more or less the same size dimension as the thing that you want to probe. Okay. If we now compare seeing with the touching, then the wavelength of our radiation can represent the size, the size of the probe. So if we want to see atoms, then we need X-rays. Let's have a look back to the electromagnetic spectrum. You see that here we have proteins, molecules, and here we have at atoms, even if they are not written the atom dimension is such that I definitely need x-rays to be used if I want to see atoms. And this is the reason also why I cannot see uh, atoms by eye, because my eye is sensitive to, to the visible light. And let's have a look where the visible light is. The visible light is here. So by eye, in principle, the best I can see is a is uh, a, a bacterium. And typically I will not be able to see it by eye. I will have to use a microscope, a, a laboratory microscope. And that's the limit of that kind of instrument. Even the best microscope in the world, the most expensive, the, the, the top of the top will have a physical limit. It will not be possible with that instrument to see something smaller than bacteria. If you want to see something smaller, you have to use a different light or a different radiation. In that case, that will be ultraviolet or soft X-rays. Okay. Before discussing how to generate X-rays, there is another important point. How bright our light source should be. So what is the brightest light source that you can think about? Probably some of you will answer the sun. Okay, let's talk about the sun for a, for a minute. This is a map of uh, different brightnesses for different stars. Our sun is there, more or less in the middle. You can see that you have stars that can be one million times brighter than our sun. So let's suppose that the brightest stars that are over there are one million times bright, brighter than uh, our sun. The point is to understand if that kind of brightness is enough for our purposes. So let's 
put this uh, uh, topic in, 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 in the waiting uh, room for a while and go back to another analogy. Let's go back to the dark room. Uh, now I ask a different, a different thing. The room is pitch black and I want, to, I want you to get into the room and give a description of the room itself. Well, if it is completely dark, you will not see anything. So the, the best you can do is to touch around and, and tell me, well, maybe here there is a table, maybe here we have a sofa, but I don't see what is the color. I don't see if they have a, a drawing on, on top of them and so on. So I, I definitely need a light source. Okay, I give you a candle. You go inside with a candle, you will see things, but you will have two problems. First of all, the candle is can illuminate just a small portion of the whole room. Moreover, the light of the candle is such that the colors will not be the real colors. The light of the candle is kind of yellowish or reddish and will modify the true colors of the things that are in, in our room. Okay, what a ne what's next? A flashlight. If you go with a flashlight, you will see things better and you will get all the details of the room in less time than uh, the case of the, of the candle. The last uh, phase, if we simply switch on all the spotlights on the ceiling of our, of our room, and then in a second, in a snapshot, I have the full picture of my room. That is to say what? The concept, there are two important concepts. Uh, the level of details is getting better if I use more light, as well as the time I need to perform my experiment, which means to, to, to learn how the room is organized, the time is getting less and less if I have more light. So the rule is that, the more light you use, the more detailed information you get, and the less time you spend doing that. So basically the experiment is better performed, gives better results, and take, takes less time to be carried out. And this is extremely important. And this is why we need a bright light source. So we need a bright source that is capable of delivering X-rays because I saw that I want to see atoms. Okay, how can we do that? This is why we build synchrotrons, because synchrotrons are bright and they generate X-rays. So let's have a quick look about what a synchrotron is. If you go to Wikipedia, you will read that a synchrotron is a particular type of cycle particle accelerator in which the accelerating particle beams travels around a fixed closed loop path. The key point is having a particle beam, a beam of particles that I have to accelerate some, somehow. What kind of particles we use in a synchrotron? We use electrons. We already heard about electrons. Where can we find electrons? Well, in uh, everyday life, electrons are flowing in our electrical uh, wires in our houses. Electrons are what lightning are made of. In the picture I saw, I show you before, the electrons are those tiny particles that are orbiting around the, the nucleus of the atom. So if I want to generate electrons, I need an, a, what is called an electron gun. What would be an electron gun? Well, it's nothing more nothing different than what was the core of the old TVs. In the old TVs where you have the, the so-called the cathodic tube, everything was, was started by the generation of a beam of electrons, which were then accelerated and deviated properly onto a fluorescent screen. And on the fluorescent screen, then you have the images of your TV. At the beginning of that tube, you had an electron gun. 
simply. So an electron gun, you can have it by simply heating up a metallic filament, and from the filament, you will have the release of electrons. Quite simple. Let's go to the uh, idea of a, of a synchrotron. So a synchrotron, this is a pictorial view of a synchrotron. It seems to be quite complicated, but if you follow me, you will see that it's conceptually not so complicated. So the electron gun is here at the beginning in the center of the ring. You have the generation of the electrons, which are accelerated in a linear accelerator. And then they are put into a first ring, which is called the booster ring. And in the booster ring, both the speed and the energy of the electron beam are raised to the level that we need. Once we get to that level, the, these electrons are injected into the so-called storage ring, which is this bigger ring, where they keep on circulating for hours, days, or you name it. Then from this storage ring, you can see that there are structures that are called beamlines, at the end of which you find experimental stations. And that are the places where the experiments really take place. Take place. This is the, I, the general idea of a synchrotron. Beware of one thing. Now I was kind of, uh, let's say, uh, fool you a, a little bit in the sense that, okay, I talked about electrons. We had electrons in the electron gun. We accelerate them, the booster ring, the storage ring, but then we have beam lines and experimental stations. So where does the light get into the playground? I mean, we said at the beginning that we want to generate light. We want to generate X-rays, radiation to do our experiments. Where is the light coming from? Well, the trick to get light, which is radiation from an electron, consists in accelerating it. You all know what an acceleration is. When you are driving in your car, if you increase or decrease your speed in the, in, in the, in the period when this happens, that is an acceleration. It can be positive if you increase your speed, or it can be negative if you decrease, if you break, that is a negative acceleration. Physics tells you that if you have a charged particle, which is an electron, which has an electric charge, and if you accelerate it, you will have the emission of light. But how is that possible? I will not go into the physical detail of that, but I will use another analogy to hopefully make you a little bit understand what I'm referring to. Let's suppose you have a truck which is entering a corner and the truck has a, a load in, in its back. Okay, let's say that the truck is the electron and the load is the energy that this electron is carrying with itself. If you enter the corner and you steer, let's say abruptly, uh, the steering wheel, something will happen. You inside the, 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 the truck, you will feel a centrifugal acceleration. You will be pushed to the outside of the corner. Am I right? But why that will happen? That will happen because the truck will feel a centripetal acceleration. That means that the, it, it will change in its direction in, towards the inside of the corner. Okay, and what happens to the load? If the, load, if the speed is, is high, this could happen. The electrons keep on traveling on the corner, around, along the corner, while the, the load, in this case, the energy, is, uh, let's say, thrown straight. It, 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 it keeps going straight as it was before entering the corner. And this is a mechanism which is very similar for electrons. If you somehow make electron, electrons turning, 
they will emit radiation. They will lose energy that they were carrying, like the load on their back. And this energy will manifest into the form of synchrotron radiation. And this is why synchrotron facilities are schematically like that. First of all, I talk about rings, but the storage ring, so the main bigger ring, is a polygon. Why a polygon? Because a polygon has some corners. Uh, in this case, there are four, eight, 12 corners. That means that there will be 12 points where electrons will turn and some light will be emitted and it will go straight, like the green arrows that you can see here. Okay, so the only thing to do is to steer electrons. How do we steer electrons? Well, one way to steer electrons is to use, to use magnets. And magnets, you all know what magnets are. In everyday life, we are used to this kind of magnets, uh, which are permanent magnets. I mean, they are things that are always magnetized and they are always attracting metallic pieces like uh, nails or, or clips or whatever. These are permanent magnets, but they are not strong enough for our purposes. In a synchrotron, we have permanent magnets that are so strong that a magnet as big as a coin can hold up up to nine kilograms, which are 20 ounces. So for a, for a magnet, which is this small, this is quite impressive. That's because we definitely need high magnetic fields to curve, to bend the, the trajectory of an electron. Another way to generate a magnetic field is to let the electrical current flow through a wire. And in this way, it is possible to build so-called electromagnets, which in this case are called bending magnets, which are big things. They are meters, uh, one meter high and some meters long, and they are very heavy. They are several tons in which we circulate high currents in order to generate high magnetic fields. What this high means? We are talking about 1.5 Tesla. Tesla nowadays is a very famous name, but I, maybe you know that Tesla is the family name of Nikola Tesla, who was a famous scientist, who was really one of the, of the fathers of the modern physics. And the measurement unit of the magnetic field is named Tesla in his honor. So, for instance, the magnetic field of Earth, which is the one that orientates our, the, the, what is the English for this? It's not, it's not scale. Okay, I don't remember. The one that is used by uh, sailors uh, that is pointing always to north, uh, that the instrument is... Uh, okay. The compass? The compass, yes, sorry. I, I'm, I'm supposed to know that. The compass, thank you. So the magnetic field that is uh, orientating every compass in the world is just this one, 0 0.00003 Tesla, which is very, very small. In our case, our magnets at the synchrotron can generate 1.5 Tesla which means that we are talking uh, about a magnetic field which is uh, uh, about 10,000 times higher than the magnetic field at the, on, on Earth. A magnetic bar like the one of the, uh, that we saw at the beginning are something like uh, one hundredth of Tesla. A NMR machine can uh, generate up to seven Tesla. So, just to say that this 1.5 Tesla that we use at the synchrotron is definitely not the highest possible magnetic field that we can generate, but still is quite a, a good number. And this, well, this slide is, okay, I will show, the, show it just because there is a picture that I want to show, which is related to San Francisco, but that's on the, the only reason. Okay, so we saw that the, if this track is performing one single corner, 
there will be the emission of synchrotron radiation. Like, like here, we have the magnetic field, which is deviating the electron beam, and we have the emission of this synchrotron light. And in this case, the emission is, uh, the, the characteristic of this emission is that the flux is not so high. So the intensity of this light that is generated is not, is not so high. Is it possible to do something to increase this intensity, this brightness? Yes, it is possible. And the trick is that along the straight section of the polygon, instead of letting electrons simply go straight, I make them ondulate, pretty much as Lombard Street in San Francisco. And what happens? It happens that on each individual corner of this ondulation, there will be the emission of one flash of light. And the, these devices are tuned in such a way that then all these small flash, flashes sum up uh, co coherently in order to give rise to an emission which is much, much brighter than the emission of the single magnetic uh, bendy magnet that we have in the first example. And so this is uh, how we get to the brightness that we were looking for. And how much, how much is the brightness that we need? Okay, we were going back to the sun and the stars. We were asking ourselves, is the sun enough, uh, is, br is bright enough to be used for our purposes? The, the, the answer is definitely no. The sun is not bright enough at all. And moreover, it even does not deliver X-rays, which we are interested in. We need synchrotrons, but how bright is a synchrotron then with respect to the sun, for instance? In this graph, you have the, the answer. If the sun is here and it is bright at, at a certain point, the ondulator, so the, 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 the best, uh, uh, emission that you can have at a synchrotron, in this case, this is actually the synchrotron of Berkeley, is one billion time, times more than the brightness of the sun. So the synchrotron in Berkeley, not only that one, but that synchrotron is one billion times brighter than the sun. And this is definitely important because as we saw um, we need a bright source to see things better okay what can we do with this light i mean once the light uh, is generated by the, the the synchrotron how can we uh transport it to the experiment because you remember uh the the picture, you have the storage ring, and then you have these beam lines that are departing from the storage ring. And at the end of each beam line, you have the experimental end station. We need an optical system in, in, in between the storage ring and the, and the end station, which is called the beam line. So here you have, again, the scheme. This is the synchrotron, which is generating light from one point, for instance one of the corners, for instance, this light is going straight and I build an optical system which is uh, collecting the light, is uh, manipulating the light, and then is sending the light to the experiment where I will then uh, perform my experiment on the sample that I want to study, okay? And a beam lane is something like this. Here you have, the emission of the light by the synchrotron. The light is these red beams here. And the light, in order to be sent to the sample on the other side of the, of the slide, goes through some elements, which can be mirrors, which can be slits and gratings. That's because you need to collect the, the, the light, the radiation, and you have to deflect it if needed, and then you have focus the radiation in order to create the smallest possible 
spot, light spot on your sample in order to study that point there. Here I'm talking, okay, and this is how an experimental station looks like. You see, you have millions of cables and you have pipes and instruments and, 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 and stuff and mess, but everything has a, a, a definite uh, purpose and, and uh, is used for, for something. Okay, just some curiosities about these mirrors because these are really special and, and, and peculiar objects. So first of all, we are not using mirrors as everybody is used to in, in normal life. How do you use a mirror in your, in your house? Well, you go to the bathroom in the morning, you put yourself in front of the mirror and what happens? It happens that the light coming either from the window or from the lamp on the wall is the light goes to your nose, is reflected by your nose, goes to the mirror and to the mirror back to your eye. In this way, your eyes sees your nose. Okay, quite simple. But how are you, how you are using your mirror? Well, you are putting yourself in front of the mirror so the light is traveling perpendicularly to the surface of the mirror okay this is a way that we cannot that cannot work with synchrotron light that's because synchrotron light synchrotron radiation if hits a mirror surface perpendicularly will will be absorbed nothing will be reflected back this is pretty much like when you are on the beach and you take a, a small rock and you throw it to the surface of to the water surface what happens if you throw it from top of the water the stone will go to the water and then it will go to the bottom of, of the sea okay it will not go come back it will not bounce back can it can it uh, bounce somehow on the surface of the water well if you have a flat stone and you throw the stone more or, less, more or less parallel to the surface of the water, it could happen that the, the stone is bouncing on the surface of the water, right? I think that when you were kids, at least you, you, did, you did this, this uh, you play like that. What is changing? What is changing is the geometry of your uh of you throwing the stone instead of throwing the stone perpendicularly to the surface you are throwing it um more or less almost parallelly to the surface it's uh, what it is it is called grazing incidence so the the trajectory of your stone is almost parallel to the surface of the water we do the same with synchrotron radiation and mirrors you can see here the synchrotron radiation, if it hits a mirror coming grazing, it will be reflected. And this is a way to handle this kind of radiation with mirrors. Uh, this, how, this is how these mirrors look like. They are quite uh, interesting object uh, for different reasons. First of all, well, they are very expensive. They can cost from several tens of thousand dollars to almost a million dollars for a piece of glass, which, is, which could be not more than this big. It could be one meter long. That can cost one million dollars. Why it is so expensive? Well, first of all, there are very few companies worldwide that, produces, that produce these kind of mirrors. And second, and most important, the shape of the surface of the mirror is so precise that they cost millions for that reason. Imagine this, how much is the precision, how much is the quality of the manufacturing of this mirror? Well, supposed to have, they can build a mirror one meter long, okay? A flat mirror. So that means that the surface of the mirror is completely flat. How flat 
is it? The analogy is the following. If you build, build a railroad between San Francisco and Los Angeles, which is 550 kilometers, it's, uh, I don't know, 300 miles or something like that, this rail railroad should be perfectly horizontal with a, a maximum deviation from this flatness of not more than half a millimeter over 500 kilometers. It's a level of flatness that is incredible. Basically, these mirrors are flat to the atomic level. And that's why they cost so much. And we need definitely this kind of shapes because otherwise our synchrotron radiation would be deformed along the, 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 his travel to the, to the experiment. Okay, then, Another curiosity, we need also another thing which is called diffraction gratings. What is a diffraction grating? Well, we have an analogy. The prism, what does the prism to the white light? It separates, separates it into the rainbow. We saw before that. Okay, what if I simply block all the colors except one, except the blue, like in this example? I am monochromatizing my light. Okay, and this is possible with a prism. Prism and lenses are not usable with synchrotron radiation because uh, they tend to absorb this radiation. So, as I said, we have to use mirrors in grazing incidence. Okay, how can I get the same effect of a prism? Well, we can have it by modifying the surface of a mirror. Uh, you have uh, you have seen this kind of image in your life many many times. This is the surface of a CD or a DVD. You see the rainbow there, right? Why do you see the rainbow on the surface of a C or, or a CD or a DVD? That's because the surface of that disc is uh, full of grooves that are basically the the same as it was on all uh, vi uh, vinyls, uh, music vinyls, okay? You have these grooves on, on your discs, and if you go from the center of the disc to the outside of the disc, you will experience the presence of many, many grooves one after the other. This is creating an effect that gives you the rainbow. You can do the same on a mirror, and here you see the effect of it, by engraving grooves on the surface of the mirror. And in that case, the grooves are so uh, dense that you cannot see them by eye, but they create the same effect as the, the prism. In this way, you can have monochromators that monochromatize light, and we will see later why monochromatization, monochromatization is important. Okay, uh, some... Um, folklore notes, uh, how many beam lines can be hosted into a synchrotron? Here you have the schemes of different synchrotrons. As you can see, in each synchrotron, it is possible to host several tens of, uh, of beam lines. And this is important for the following reason. This means that in the, simultaneously in a synchrotron, you can have many different experiments that are running at the same time. And this is extremely important for scientists because you can increase the number of experiments that are performed in a synchrotron. How many synchrotrons we have in the world? Well, in the world, we have about 50 facilities that are more or less distributed like this. We have a Zoom for North America and Europe. Uh, well, for instance, in, in your area, you have a synchrotron in Berkeley and another one in Stanford. And then on the other coast, you have a synchrotron in New York. Uh, well, it's not on the coast, but then you have a synchrotron in Chicago and then other synchrotrons uh, in other places. This is how they look like uh, from above. This is Electra. This is the ALS in Berkeley. Then we have the French, the British, and the Japanese. The Japanese is so big that you have a hill 
in the middle of the ring. This is a, a close-up of the advanced light source in Berkeley. You can see that it's definitely the best synchrotron in the world for what concerns uh, the, the sightseeing. And it, it's really, really nice, but it's also really a, a, a good uh, synchrotron. How do they look inside? Inside, they look like that. Uh, you have pipes, you have instrumentations, you have uh, walls, uh, shielding walls, and stuff like that. And this is the part of the ring. And then you have the beam lines. The beam lines, again, you have pipes, which are bringing your light down to the experimental uh, end station. Okay. And then this is... Uh, what we are interested in, the properties of matter. Marco, so can we take a pause for a minute? We have a few questions lined up. Yes, definitely. Okay, um, let me see. We have a question from Sarah. I think she asked hers first. Want to come on, Sarah, unmute. Uh, okay, um, well, actually, I, I thought of several things, Marco, but um, I will start with um, asking you um, how, besides the fact that physically they're different, how um, do we need all those? Do we need more? Do we, um, do they do actually different things or do they all kind of okay. do similar things? The, well, first of all, every single synchrotron does different things. I mean, it, it would be completely no sense to have, let's say, 30 different beam lines, all of them doing the same kind of experiment. So within right. a single uh, synchrotron, you have many different experiments and techniques that can be possible. And uh, OK, then with respect to other synchrotrons, I would say that uh, they are quite similar. The only main difference could be related to uh, what portion of the electromagnetic spectrum they, they can generate. So the ALS in Berkeley, Electra in Trieste, they generate uh, uh, radiation in the ultraviolet and soft X-rays. Other synchrotrons are more devoted in generating hard x-rays so higher energy radiation and the major difference between these two classes is the the sizes the size of the als is a is a circle of about 100 meter diameter while higher syn other synchrotrons like the japanese one they have one kilometer diameter so they are much bigger because in order to generate <laughs> Uh, hard x ray, they need more space and okay, whatever. Um, do we need all of them? I would say yes. And the, uh, the motivation is quite simple. Every synchrotron, every, ever, every average synchrotron in the world typically is capable of, uh, uh, let's say, hosting just one third or, or one fourth of all the experiments that would be proposed for that synchrotron. So that means that uh, there is a, a continuous uh, demand for beam time. Uh, that's because, I mean, in principle, it would be even go good if we have twice or three times the number of synchrotons, the synchrotons that we have now in the world. But of course, they are quite expensive and every country will accept uh, the US China and Japan cannot afford more than one synchrotron facility in that country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Thank you, thank you Marcus. And, uh, Roger had a question or two. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you already answered some of my questions. One was about um, where they are in the world. You, you had a map about that. And then um, do we need more? Is that enough? Well, as said, uh, in principle, we would need more because uh, uh, as said, uh, uh, well, uh, if you want to perform an experiment at a synchrotron, 
the process is the following. You propose an experiment and the, this proposal is evaluated by an ex, a, a panel of experts, which, are, which, by the way, do not belong to that synchrotron. So the, you want to avoid uh, conflict of interest. So an external bunch of people decide, uh, evaluate your proposal. And if it is good enough, they grant you some beam time for your experiments. And as said, uh, on let's say if there are 100 proposals, a synchrotron can host just one third, one third of that, just 30 proposals. So in principle, if we double the number of synchrotrons, still there will be uh, room for even more. So in principle, yes, but uh, as said, they are very expensive, and it's not feasible uh, to 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 have more than one or two in each country. Yes, yeah, so a follow-up question on that. Um, um, you mentioned at the beginning something about materials that um, synchrotrons can be used to evaluate materials. So yes. is that um, materials like uh, ceramics and uh, some of these uh, new materials that people are, are creating, is, are these used to um, to study uh, the properties of, let's say, nanomaterials or something. Definitely, I, I will show. I will show later on in the presentation some examples. But I would say that synchrotrons are probably. Well, I'm. I'm of course working in a synchrotron, so it's, it's uh, natural that I'm saying that. But are among the best places where you can study new materials. Mm. I will show you why materials are perfectly studied by synchrotrons uh, that's ba basically i can anticipate basically because with synchrotron light you can understand everything from the point of view of the chemistry of your sample so you can know what kind of elements are inside uh, what kind of chemical state do they have and then you can infer all the properties that these materials can have so typically what happens is that you have labs where, where they create new materials and then they send these materials to synchrotron where these materials are characterized. So for, for, the, for these materials, you then um, study every possible thing about the, every possible properties, electronic, chemical, physical. Well, the slide that is in this moment uh, sure is really talking about that with synchrotrons we can we can determine uh, all the properties of a material and then we can then uh, decide if that ma material is uh, good for a particular application or if there are still there is still the need to study more because we start to understand something but we need more studies about that so the process is this one Generally speaking, I also see, I think you also uh, posed the question about private companies and... Right, uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Synchrotrons, generally speaking, are places where you perform basic research, basic science, mm -hmm. which means that uh, on average, when you end an experiment at a synchrotron, is it doesn't happen that then i don't know the month after a new uh, microprocessor will come out on the market or a new uh, cell phone will be put on the market because because of the results that i found uh, at the synchrotron at the synchrotron we typically study materials in the early stages of the study mm -hmm. i always Use this example. In these years, I mean, we are the the um, since uh, half of uh, last century, we are in the age of silicon, because mm -hmm. silicon is the base material for all microprocessors, uh, so computers, uh, cell phones, uh, communication, uh, TVs, and, and so on. How, how it, it happened that silicon became the 
king of all the material. Mm. Well, silicon is nothing more than uh, fused sand, glass, a kind of glass, basically. So it has been known since centuries. What happened is that during last century, there, were, uh, there was the development of new uh, instruments, new experimental techniques, including the first synchrotrons. And there they start studying silicon and they immediately figured out that this material had some specific and very interesting properties. And that drove the continuation of the studies on silicon and year after year, experiment after experiment, at the end, in the, I don't know, in the 50s or 60s, the first computers came out. They were huge, only the, 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 the government was able to afford one of them, but still, something was starting. And keeping on uh, studying uh, silicon, brought us to have now uh, in, in, in this thing here, this is a USB key, key pen. This has a, a capacity, which is, namely is 64 gigabyte. Okay, 50 years ago, one, one room was full with a, with a, with a hard disk which was capable of containing 40 megabytes. And now we have 60 gigabytes, which is a thousand times more in this, in this thing here. This is only because in the meantime, uh, studies went on and they, every time there was something better uh, coming out. So at the synchrotrons, we typically, are in the early stages of the study of new materials. So for instance, now you will probably heard about the graphene. Graphene is now only 15 years that is, uh, let's say on top of the interest uh, in, the, in the scientific world because of, this, uh, of its uh, properties. But still, we are still studying it in order to see if it, if it will become the new silicon. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Joe had his hand up and after him, uh, Jim was also wanted to ask a question. Marco, I'm going to have to cut all the questions, many of the questions that I had for you. Let me ask a basic question. First of all, uh, you talked about uh, wavelengths and x-rays, and I take it that the smaller the wavelength, the finer the uh, ability to, to read. Correct? Well, the smaller the wavelength, the uh, let's say the easier it is to study small things like atoms. Right, right. Mm. And so now, when you talked about the given that you talked about the electrons first coming in to the accelerator, and you said there was a booster. Yes. W what gets it though? It's not changing the wavelength. No, at that stage what we speak. So what does get boosted? Still the electrons. The electrons, okay, if, uh, let me see if I can go back to one of those pictures. Yeah, Basically, what is boosted? <laughs> still electrons. So we generate electrons, we accelerate them, we boost them, then we store them into the storage ring, and only then, when we have this big polygon where, where the electrons are flowing, then from that point on, we have the generation of uh, light. So where I got lost is if you're not changing the wavelength, you're boosting. I'm trying to understand what it means to boost an electron. You're not changing the wavelength. You're not changing the speed. You're limited by the speed No, of no, light. I, I do change. What does get boosted? It, it, I, it, the speed is changed and oh. also the energy of the electron beam. That's because if you want to generate X-rays, the electron beam should be energetic enough and it should be fast enough. So this is where you are boosting 
this is why you are boosting the electrons because otherwise the generation of light would uh, give you not x-rays but would give you oh, i don't know ultraviolet or visible light so only if uh, uh, the uh, the electron energy is getting is, is raised and and also it's also the velocity of the electrons is raised then you will have the generation of the x-rays which is the one we are interested in so the electrons within the synchrotron are moving at what speed almost at the speed of light almost yes at that's 99%? because uh it's uh 99.9995 okay. or something okay. like that yeah okay almost at the speed of light i uh, thank you i don't I know. You're welcome. Okay, Jim, your turn. When, when you were in Berkeley, were you working at the ALS? I was, uh, well, I was within the ALS building, but I was working in an in a, in a independent laboratory where we were developing um, an instrument that then was attached to one of the beam lines at ALS. But when I was there, we were developing these uh, instruments. Later on, I, I came back, the development went on, and then this instrument was uh, attached to one of the end station within the, the synchrotron itself. And then a, a more technical question. How close do the undulator magnetic pole tips need to be to the electron beam? And what is the correlation of pole tip spacing to wavelength generation? That uh, okay. Let me let me go back here. Uh, so the the answer to the first question is uh, that distance could be from uh, in the range of millimeters. So uh, the distance between the the poles, the magnetic poles, can be something between uh, five millimeters up to. 40 millimeters and the uh, i mean the correlation between the magnetic poles and the electron beam so why let me let me come here hopefully i will finally get there okay here so what i'm saying is that sorry mm, pointer laser pointer okay what i'm saying is that this distance between the right and the left arrays can be between 5 to 40 millimeters and if you change this distance you change the magnetic field experienced by the electrons and so you basically are changing the the corners so how much the electrons are turning? If, they are, if the magnets are, are, are very distant, the, the magnetic field is low, and so the electrons will only mildly ondulate. If you start to close the magnets, the field will become higher, and so the corners will be much more pronounced. And this, in turn, ends up with the the final emission wavelength being varied. I mean, depending on, on the distance between the magnet, you, you can select the final wavelength of emission for your synchrotron radiation. Thank you. I, I hope it was so, somehow clear. Oh, I, think, I think that's all the questions for the moment. Carry on. OK, so let me get back to the slide where I was. So I was saying that, uh, as we also discussed uh, right now, that with synchrotron, it is possible to study the properties of matter, which means that we can characterize matters, matter in terms of electric properties, magnetic properties, mechanical properties, uh, structural properties, uh, thermal properties, and so on and so forth. And why do we do that? That's because, of course, the, a full characterization of a material will then tell us 
how that material can be possibly used for for applications so let me uh, just close this window okay um so i um so the idea is that I want to determine and characterize the properties of the materials in order to know completely the system and use them for possible applications. So what can we do? Oh, I, I, oh, this is probably the most, uh, let's say, technical part. I decided to put it because really this technique is the fundamental technique uh, in synchrotrons and i think that at the end maybe you will i will try to to let you understand what is all about photo emission is a technique is an experimental technique which tells you the chemical specificity of your sample which means that you know what is made of what is the chemical formula and what is, what is the chemical state for instance iron iron you can be you can have metallic iron which is pure iron you can have iron oxide which is rust you can have iron bonded to another element and then you will have uh, something like uh, i don't know some uh, leagues uh, like bronze or i don't know other materials and it's extremely important to be able to determine the chemistry of of the sample of the of the of, of the system that you you are dealing with so how to do that imagine that you want to know what is inside the, a box what you can do is to shake the box and hear how it sounds i mean if it shakes like a glass maybe inside you have glasses you have a, something like that if it shakes uh, like rocks, then probably you will have a, a beautiful gift of, of, of bricks. I don't know. We do something very similar in the sense that we shake our system. So we give an excitation, we excite our system, and we monitor how the sy system reacts. This is a way to, uh, to probe a material, just to see how it react okay again in wikipedia the photo emission is described like this it is the process where some radiation in 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 our case synchrotron light is sent to the surface of my material and then after the light hits my material we have the emission of electrons okay and so what this is the, a more realistic picture. We illuminate, illuminate our, sam, our sample where there are a lot of atoms. And then from the atoms, some electrons are generated. Okay. Note, this is the reason why Einstein got his Nobel Prize. Not for the relativity theory or, or stuff like that. He got the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect which is the description of what I just said to you. Basically, synchrotron light knocks out some electrons and we simply collect these electrons and measure them. And what we, under, uh, what we can learn about the system? Well, again, <clears throat> this is the picture. We have, let's start with the atoms. We have the atoms in, in our material. You remember that the atoms is a nucleus with some electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus, OK? Why, this, why the electrons around the nucleus don't go away? That's because they are bound to the nucleus. And they are bound with a so-called binding energy. So there is a strength that is keeping the electron close to the nucleus, OK? I want to measure that. I want to measure what is the energy that keeps an electron together with its nucleus to measure that 
I illuminate my atom with some light that, as we saw, is carrying some energy with it. Okay, forget about that. In order to escape the surface of the material, I, there is a, a, a small barrier to, to cross, but okay, forget it. I end with my electrons and I measure the speed of these electrons, which means their kinetic energy, their energy. Einstein simply said, simply, let's say, uh, recap the whole story like this. He said, the final energy of the electrons in blue is nothing more than the initial energy of my light minus the energy that I had to give the system in order to extract my electrons. Okay, this is the process. <clears throat> that means that if I know completely the final energy of my electrons, so the blue, this blue uh, thing here, and I know the electron of the, the energy of the synchrotron light that I used to excite my system, by simply solving this equation, I will get the binding energies of my atoms. This is another way to see. It. I shine and then I get something which is telling me, oh, look, the binding energy of what do we have in your material are those. And why are, why are binding energy so important? That's because every element in the periodic table of the elements has a unique set of binding energies. It's like a fingerprint. So once you are able <clears throat> to determine the binding energy or that are in, in, in the material that you are studying, then you will immediately know what's inside that material. What are the different elements that are, that are inside that material? And so we can identify every single element. And this is a breakthrough. Even if my system is completely unknown, I have a way to know how it is made. OK, that, that's uh, important. Then, for instance, at the synchrotron, we can perform also microscopy, which means that I can, uh, start, I can determine the morphology, so the, the shape of my, of my surface with a resolution, so with a detail as low as some nanometers. I remember uh, this is a, a picture where uh, there are some numbers about a nanometer. How much is a nanometer? A nanometer is an incredible small uh, distance, is one billionth of meter. Just to give you an, an example, uh, here you have, for instance, the DNA helicoidal uh, structure is 2.5 nanometers. When men shave their face with your shave, you start from one side and you go to the other side. After you do like that, at the starting point, you have already 10, nanom 10, 10 nanometers of new hair that was grown in this time. So in one second, my hair is growing 10 nanometers, just to give you an idea how small is a nanometer. And we can determine the structure and the morphology of, of a surface with that kind of level. And so combining the photo emission that, we, that gives you the chemical map the, the, sorry, the chemical species that are inside my, my sample, together with microscopy, I definitely can reconstruct from a morphology and, and a chemical point of view, the surface of my system. Okay, that was uh, basically the, the end of the, of the part dedicated to synchrotron. Then there are some applications. So if you want, if there are other questions now, or I can move on. Let's just tell me as you prefer to 
or if you want to have a, a small break, as you prefer. <clears throat> I, I think uh, given the time, it'd be, you know, I don't want to impose on your time. I know it's 1.30 in the morning. Maybe you should just continue. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I will give some brief example of possible application at synchrotrons. So as said, at a synchrotron, for instance, it is possible to study materials for more efficient energy storage. That's because, again, I can get a microscopical view of, in this case, one of the particles of my battery during the charge and discharge cycles. And for each image, I can see the different chemistry that is going on in, in this uh, particle. So I, I definitely understand how it is evolving during charge and discharge. And so this is important because in that way, I can then work on building better and better batteries, for instance. At Synchrotron, we are definitely working on more efficient energy storage materials. Another very important application, mammography with synchrotron radiation. Mammography is, is just a, a, a radiography. And the pro what is the problem with mammography in, in, in hospital? The problem, as for every kind of radiography, is that you have a certain dose which is transferred to the, to the, to the person. So that means that you cannot uh, do many, many radiographies. Uh, I mean, you cannot do more than two radiographies of, 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 of the chest per year, I think, something like that. So with the synchrotron, the dose which is delivered to the body is one tenth. So it's much, much less. So in principle, the technique is much safer, or you can see it also in another way. You can do 10 times more radiographies in order to follow the evolution of what you are analyzing. So that's good. Moreover, also the detail is much, much better. You can see in this picture on the left, you have an image taken at a traditional hospital mammography machine. And on the right, you have an image taken at a synchrotron. You can see that the level of detail is definitely better for the synchrotron one. Okay, then another very important uh, technique, protein crystallography. Proteins are really at the heart of all biological processes. And knowing the structure of, of uh, every single protein is mandatory for many, many applications. So how can I determine the structure of a, of a protein? Let's use, an, again, an analogy. If you have, like in this case, uh, a woman in front of a, of a wall, I shine some light, and there is the shadow on the wall, which is replicating the profile of this woman. Clear enough? I hope so, yeah. Okay, in this case, I already see, I mean, I, I mean, I see the face of the woman because the picture is like that. But what if I have this kind of shadow? This kind of shadow tells me what? Is it a man? Is it a woman? Uh, uh, big nose, big ears? I don't know. What can I do? Well, one possibility is that I take the same person and I ask, to rotate a little bit, and then I get a second shadow. Am I right? This is a second shadow. OK, now what can I say? Still, is it a woman, a man? Probably a man. Uh, the hair, well, I don't know. Still, I don't see the nose. OK, what, what, what's next? I can ask the person to rotate a little bit more. And I'm sure that now you will get who is this. That now we know that this guy is 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 the guy, because I at the beginning I didn't know that. Only by rotating the sample, 
it was possible to determine its uh, three-dimensional structure, it, what is called a tomography. And this is what we do with proteins. We have proteins, we put a, a protein crystal here, we rotate, rotate it, and for each uh, angle, we kind of shine the light and project the, 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 the similar as, as the shadow, and then we build the structure of the protein. In this way, it is possible to determine the structure of the proteins, and that is really important because, for instance, medicines, mo many medicines, I'm not uh, an expert in that, but I was, I, I, I've been told that, and, and what I've been told is that medicine can work with a mechanism, a medicine can be made of proteins. And uh, the mechanism is that the protein, once it reaches the proper receptor in, in the body, only if the shape of the protein is right, the proper one, you have a key lock mechanism and the protein is capable of being attached to the target. And in that moment, then the healing process will start. So it's extremely important to be able to determine the structure of the protein. And this is possible at the synchrotron. And in this way, you can also think about the possibility to design new medicine simply by tuning a little bit the structure until you find the right key to act on, I don't know, on, on, on neurons, for instance, in order to control, for instance, the Alzheimer's disease. This is a, a, one of the possible scenarios that we are working on. Another uh, application, magnetic memories for computers. In this moment, if you switch off, if you switch off your computer, what happens? If you had something in the, in the memory, when you switch it on again, that is gone. So if you control copy something in a Word document and then you switch off the computer and you switch it on again, if you passed, you will not pass anything because the information has gone. That's because current memories um, works with electricity. So if you, if you switch off the computer, nothing will, will stay there. A different story if that memory is based on magnetic materials and magnetic materials, pretty much like the hard, disk, hard disks, they maintain the information even if you switch off the system. In this way, it is possible to design new memories for computers where for which it will be uh, possible not to lose data and also when you switch on the computer, you will not have to wait seconds or minutes uh, to let the computer start properly. They will be immediately on. And with this kind of material, uh, it will be possible to use less power. These materials are non-volatile, so the information is there and it will stay there. They are, they are faster, so the, all the, 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 the process that you are doing, uh, that you are using with your computer will be faster and they are almost uh, eternal and these are some of the examples this is still a niche in the market but it's becoming more and more dominant and probably will be universal at a certain point okay then the the, the beauty of synchrotron is that uh, the synchrotron is uh, a tool and then it's up to the creativity to the fantasy of the scientist to use the tool for the application he or she is interested in. For instance, they were able to study the presence and roles of metals and proteins in neurons. And this was possible only at synchrotrons. Why? Because here you have a perfect example where you have microscopy, you see the structure of the neurons, and you have also a chemical map you see this letter refers to phosphor, sulfur, zinc. So you see how the different material, the different elements are distributed along the neuron. And this gives 
of course, good information for uh, scientists uh, working in the in medicine or in, in biology or new neurobiology and so on and so forth. Another very different example is cultural heritage. They study the paintings, some paintings, some old paintings, and they saw that, for instance, for some paintings like this one, which is a Boltraffio, uh, the red paint was degraded, it, it was darker, but that's because there was a, a gray layer on top of the red. So basically, the red was kind of stained. Differently from the yellows in some of Van Gogh's paintings, also like the sunflowers, well, they saw that the, the whole yellow paint was uh, darkened and it was degraded during time. So while in the first case, it was just a layer of a kind of layer of dirt, in this case, the paint itself chemically changed the, the, the composition and so the color turned to a, a, a darker yellow. Nanofertilizer. Uh, there, is a new, there are new studies about a possible technique where you inject the nanoparticles into uh, crops, in this case, the uh, zucchini plants. Why? The idea is that these nanofertilizer are realized in such a way that they will go only where they are needed and they will release the nutrients only at the right time when the plant is ready to efficiently absorb the nutrients. And this again is possible only because with synchrotron you can disentangle the different uh, uh, contribution of the different elements, like in this case, carbon, oxygen, sodium, <clears throat> iron, and copper. So as you can see, really, really, uh, there is no limit in, in what you can, you can do. You can study pollution in a city, while well, this is a city in Thailand, Thailand, where basically they put three diff in three different points some targets, and after some days, they analyzed the targets in terms of what were the contaminants that were deposited on the target. And they saw the different composition of the pollution in the three different sites. And here you have, again, iron, copper, tellurium, arsenium, ars uh, krypton, bromium, and so on and so forth. This is another very important information that you can give to the municipality, for instance. <clears throat> Again, uh, since the synchrotron radiation is non-destructive because it, it can penetrate materials without destroying them, it was used to study all the violins and cellos from uh, important Italian uh, luthier like Andrea Guarnieri. And uh, with this technique, it was possible to study the thickness of the violin or the stratigraphy of the different uh, paints on, on, on the surface of the violin. Or it was possible to study the interior of a cellulose, like to see uh, the gluing of the different material, how the, the, the technique of attaching one piece to the other, and so on uh, and so forth. Then it was possible to study a, a, a very... Hmm, hmm, critical problem nowadays is the uh, distribution of microplastics in, in, in the world, in the globe. And unfortunately, they were able to find that some insect-like uh, organism that were found uh, on, uh, on some polystyrene in the, the north of, of Europe, uh, this uh, in, insect-like uh, thing had digested microplastics and it was possible to reveal that. And it, that gave uh, a warning that uh, about, about how much widespread is, the, is this uh, pollution by microplastics uh, around, around the world. 
last example. This is also again fantasy, free fantasy in in what you can you can study. Why the modern Homo sapiens prevail over Neanderthals? Well, one of the possible reasons is they inferred that one of the possible reasons was that the, the sapiens were better in building um, tools to, to hunt, like spur thrower or bow and arrow uh, techniques. And how do they do that? They study some uh, uh, things that they found uh, in, in, in prehistorical uh, archaeological sites, and they saw that, again, being able to determine the chemical composition of what they were studying, they saw that those guys used tree gum and beeswax in, in assembling their, uh, their, their tools, which is something that Neanderthals didn't do. And so their weapons were more efficient in, 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 in hunting than those used by the Neanderthals. And this is one of the possible reasons of why at the end the sapiens prevailed. Okay, the example of application could go on for, for hours and probably for, 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 for weeks. Just very quick fun facts. Uh, sometimes they ask me, are synchrotrons dangerous? Well, for some people, it looked like since they didn't know what the synchrotron was, they thought it was dangerous. This is a, an aerial picture taken in 1992 by a Soviet spy satellite in Trieste. This was the electrosynchrotrons being built. And since they saw this shape, they didn't know what was that. They immediately thought it was something like a new weapon or something like that. And why they were interested in, in that? Well, Trieste was at one of the edges of the Iron Curtain in Europe. So Soviets thought that, well, wait a minute, they are building something strange close to, to the border. Uh, let's have a look and, 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 and be sure that is not dangerous. Well, synchrotrons are definitely not dangerous. They are basically huge flashlights. If things go bad, they simply goes off. And you have not light anymore, but this this is what a, a synchrotron does. It's not a, a weapon. It doesn't have nothing to do with the radioactivity and so on. Okay, um, in the description of the talk, I mentioned interstellar vacuum. Uh, why? That's because the pipe that you the pipes that you saw in the pictures where electrons circulate or also the light uh, going to the experiment travels, they are, not, they are a pipe, they are metallic pipes inside of which you don't have air, but you have ultra high vacuum. You have a, a vacuum which is comparable to the vacuum that you can find in interstellar spaces, which means that we are talking about, uh, um, uh, about 100,000 particles in one cubic centimeter, while typically you have billions and billions and billions of particles. And this, Joe, since you asked me before that, the speed of light is a, almost the speed that electrons reaches, reach in the booster in order to be able to, uh, to, to generate, uh, generate X-rays. Okay, <clears throat> very last information. The circumferences of the synchrotrons can, be, can go from uh, 100 meter to some kilometers. And here you have some examples. When a synchrotron is operate, operative, it works 24 seven. So that means that uh, every moment there, there will be someone working there, carry on, carry on an experiment. So that's why we divide the working shifts and we have morning, late and night shifts. That's because we don't want to waste any minute of the light when the machine is on. <clears throat> On, on an average synchrotron, you have at least 1,000 different scientists coming from all over the world to that place every year. Of course, the bigger the synchrotron, the higher the number of scientists that can get there. And 
the electricity bill for a, a beam for a synchrotron typically uh, is something about several millions dollars several million dollars which is well quite a, an important figure okay that's it i leave you with some uh, comics that uh, we got in italy about synchro the the, the electro synchrotron in trieste and the first one in specifically is the Italian version of Mickey Mouse. And they uh, wrote a story which was uh, uh, located, I mean, the, with, the story ran inside the synchrotron. There was a mystery that uh, Mickey Mouse has to solve. And uh, just to show that luckily enough, uh, this um, part of science somehow is trying to get also to, to reach the, 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 the big audience uh, and in order not to be left alone in a niche, uh, in, in, in a part where nobody uh, cares about. Okay, I'm sorry, I was maybe too long. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hope it was at least a little bit clear. Uh, and I'm here for any kind of question that you want to to ask. Well, Marco, I, someone wrote that it was you, your presentation was magnificent. And I think that well, is thank you. Very, very well put. You know, th this is complicated stuff. And you have really made it easier to understand or less difficult. Uh, I'm not sure you ever quite went through the details of this uh, t shirt that you're showing <laughs> here. It may take too much time to do it anyway. Yeah, yeah, and, and moreover, it's definitely not my business. I so I, well, of course, I can tell you whatever that I, I mean, you, I, and you, no, nobody of us probably know <laughs> what is written there. I have a, 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 an idea about that, but not, nothing more than that. So, okay. but it's. Can you, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. I mean, thank you. So we can see you. Okay. There you yeah. are. There you are. Look at you, wide-eyed and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. So um, <laughs> I want to thank you, too, and just um, say it's a pleasure to have known you all these years, but also to finally have a better picture of what you're doing. <laughs> thank and, you. And did you notice... I had a question, a question for you, too, I think. No, I just wanted to note Hillary's background. She has the periodic table up there for you. Oh, good. You know, well yeah. done, well done. <laughs> Hi, Larry. And uh, any other questions or comments before? There's one from Jim Kennan there. What oh, is yeah. the... Audrey's got one in Jim. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for making clear something that I never knew, never understood. So you did a very nice job doing that. Well, th thank, you. thank you very much. I hope that it was at least barely understandable, but okay, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So, did Jim? Was it you that had a question? Yeah, yeah. So it was me. I'm I'm curious what the EV rating is on your synchrotron yeah. ring. So the the electron energies of, of a synchrotron, like the advanced light source in Berkeley or Electra, is uh, as high as two GeV, two giga electron volts. Uh, to give you an idea. I mean, is 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 uh, is a big number? Is a small number? Well, to give you an idea, uh, the the CERN, the particle accelerator in Geneva, the CERN, which is pretty much like the Fermi Lab in Chicago. Uh, there, they have uh, energies that are in the tera electron volt regime which means that we are talking about uh, a thousand times more than the synchrotrons. But uh, there they definitely do other things. I mean, here we use electrons just as a way to generate light, to generate the synchrotron radiation. In places like the CERN or the Fermilab, places where they study basic particle physics, what they want to do, they want to know how, for instance, the atom is made inside or how a proton is made 
inside or and so on and so forth and to do that what they do well they do something very very simple they take two part two particles and they smash them together very very hard in order to break them and they see simply the fragments that are coming out and from the fragments they infer the structure of the initial particles and so in order to go deeper and deeper you have to smash harder and harder and so that's why the energy of a place like the cern is so so much much bigger than the a place like a synchrotron because they have a, a different goal in mind they want to smash things we don't want to smash things we want to illuminate things so that's a different story so in our case the 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 energies are about uh, billions of electrons. Mm -hmm. Hey, do we have any other uh, questions Oops. before we let this man go? Okay. Take a good <laughs> rest. Yeah. No problem. Well, again, Marco, this has just been marvelous. Thank uh, you so much. I, I think there'll be more than one of us are going to watch this presentation again. To, to try and catch some more information out of it. So just like to thank you from everybody at Ashby Village. And uh, thank people. you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Marco. Okay. Thank you very much. Bravo. And thank do you. a live presentation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Okay. We're going to close down the meeting. Say hi to your family for us. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Everybody. Bye, Bye to everybody.